I've talked a lot about the actual physics of sound a lot on this channel, and how it can help you conceptualize what you are doing as a music producer. Today, I want to talk about something a little bit different, a concept that does not necessarily relate to the physics of sound, but is a base concept of audio engineering. This concept is the audio recording signal flow. Understanding the nature of how a signal moves through hardware and processing chains during the recording process is a very important thing. A very large part of audio engineering is solving problems and troubleshooting the technology that we use every day. By understanding signal flow, it makes it way easier to narrow down the problem so that it can be fixed and the music production process can continue. In this video, I'm going to walk you through a general studio signal flow and also talk about some factors that will change the path of a signal. So let's get into it. Any signal flow chain starts at the sound source. This sound source, whether it be an acoustic instrument, a vocalist, or an electronically generated signal, projects a sound comprised of compressing and refracting molecules. But how does this sound energy get recorded in today's modern systems? We know a sound is projected from a sound source, and from here the sound source is captured by a microphone. Microphones work in a variety of different ways. The three most common microphones that I see are dynamic microphones, condenser microphones, and ribbon microphones. These microphones translate the sound pressure from the sound source into a series of voltages that get transported through some type of cable. The most common version of a cable that carries audio is the XLR, but audio can be transferred by multiple different cables, all of which present different qualities. XLR cables are generally better for microphones because they carry what is called a balanced signal. This differs from the unbalanced signal that the quarter inch jack carries. A balanced signal protects from radio frequencies a lot more effectively than its counterparts, and therefore it's more dependable. The other advantage of XLR cables is that they are able to send phantom power to power condenser microphones. This is the plus 48 volt button that you see on most audio hardware. The signal that a microphone generates is called mic level, which is a very weak signal, so you need a mic preamp to convert this signal to a more appropriate level. This is known as line level, and it's 50 dB higher than mic level. Any recording device would have trouble capturing the signal without a mic preamp simply because it is so low in level. Mic preamps come in many different models and many different price ranges. It is important to do your research before buying a mic pre and do everything you can to make sure you know what you are buying. You really do pay for what you get with a mic pre. I know from my own experience that there are some really noisy mic preamps out there, so just be aware of that if you're in the market for one. The next step in our audio recording signal flow is the start of our processing step. Once the signal is converted to line level from the mic preamp, the signal would then be sent to any number of hardware processing units. Sometimes these are incorporated into a console, sometimes they are standalone units. It seems most home studios will only have a couple of hardware processing units, if any at all. This is because they're not a necessary part of the signal chain. This is simply the point in time where hardware processing would be most commonly inserted into our recording signal flow to either fix or feature the audio signal. Now that we have a treated line level signal, we want to convert it into a digital signal so that we can further work with it in our digital audio workstation. I'm assuming most professional and home studios have some kind of digital audio interface considering how powerful they are nowadays. Obviously, before the age of digital audio workstations, there really was no need for an analog to digital converter. Now it is part of the regular signal chain. All the A to D converter does is translate the analog voltage to a series of zeros and ones, depending on the different values of the voltage signal. The next step in the signal chain process is through the audio interface. This is where the digital signal from the A to D converter is sent to the computer's digital audio workstation for processing. This is where your skills come into play as a mix and mastering engineer, and you're able to work with the audio and change its characteristics for playback. Once the audio has been edited, mixed, or mastered within the digital audio workstation, it is sent back through the audio interface and re-enters the hardware signal chain. From the audio interface, it is sent this time through a D to A converter, which means digital to analog. This converts the binary signal back to a voltage. From here, the analog voltage signal is either sent to a headphone amp or some type of monitor or monitor selection system. Respectively, the headphone amp will then send the signal to the headphones for playback, and the monitor selection system will send the voltage signal to the selected set of monitors. In some cases, you will only have one pair of studio monitors. In this case, the voltage signal will be sent directly from the D to A converter to the monitors as mentioned. And finally, you hear the result. 
of the entire signal flow from either your headphones or your studio monitors. Something to take note of is that there are devices out there that incorporate several of these steps in one device. For example, I have a Hardware 11 rack, which can act as a mic preamp and audio interface, A to D and D to A converters. Now, the quality of each of these devices is usually not as good as to if you were to purchase each of them specifically. However, there are many of these interfaces out there and they can help save room and money. Let's take a quick step back and talk about a few common functions that can change the path of a signal. One of these functions are PFL and AFL switches. PFL means pre-fade or listen, and AFL means after fade or listen. These switches can be found on fader sends and determine if the signal will be sent before it reaches the level control or after. There are multiple reasons why you'd want to use either one, and AFL is pretty common when mixing as you want to hear your fader adjustments. However, a common use for PFL is for creating headphone mixes for the artists. If you send the signal pre-fader to the artist's headphone mix, you'll be able to make level adjustments in your DAW or on your console without the changes being heard in the artist's headphones. The signal is set, sent pre-fader, so the signal that is going to the artists never even pass through the level fader. Another very common way to reroute a signal is with a patch bay. Patch bays allow you to connect different sources to different destinations and save a lot of time when trying to reroute a signal to a different piece of equipment. There are a few types of patch bays and a few different configurations dedicating how a signal will be routed through the central routing point. Here are pictures of the two most common patch bays that I see. Patch bays become necessary once you start to have more complicated signal flows with more routing options. It is usually not necessary if you don't find yourself changing the routing of your studio setup. As I mentioned, patch bays also have different configurations depending on how you wire them. Typically, a patch bay will have the output directly above the input, and how you configure these input and output jacks can affect what happens from making a patch. If a patch bay is normaled, the output and the input are automatically linked, but if you patch into the output, the connection to the input will be broken and sent to wherever you patch the other end. With a half normal patch bay, you are given the ability to patch into the output without cutting the link between the jacks. Alright, so that's the end of this video. We talked about the general signal flow for recording audio and some of the most common ways we can reroute the signal. Leave a like if you found this video helpful and subscribe for more related content and make new concept related videos every Saturday. And until next time everyone, have a good day.